Mm, that music has got me fired up. Uh, hey, everybody. I, by the way, I can't wait to see the highlight video for next year when it's a bunch of Zoom calls set to that music. That might be a little less exciting. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our panel, Tips and Tricks of the Influencer Economy. Uh, I'm Matt Pittman. I'll be moderating. And I am going to let our panelists introduce themselves, uh, starting with Rachel. everyone, I'm Rachel Redner. I'm coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I am going to talk to you today about Lola Barksdale, who is my famous French Bulldog. She's on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, and we'll just talk a bunch about my strategy for growing her following, how I think about partnerships with brands, uh, what's worked for me and what might work for you. And how many followers does Lola have? Lola has 182,000 followers on Instagram and 52,000 52, followers on TikTok. And hopefully a couple more after today. <laughs> cool. Hannah. Uh, hi, I'm Hannah. I am also known as Plant Based Ho. That is my Instagram account. Um, yeah, Plant Based Ho, staying strong. Um, I'm a nano influencer to the point I don't even like the term influencer as much as it's just a, a platform. Um, centered around environmental sustainability and kind of like self-love. Um, and I also graduated from UT in May, so. Casey? Great. Hey guys, I'm Casey. I'm also coming to you live from the other side of the river in Manhattan, New York. Um, I am a social media analyst actually working at Rachel's husband's company, um, but my, I have a lot of background in <laughs> working on the paid portion of influencers and everything that goes on after the content is posted. So to start off, um, I would love it if, if each of you could say how you got into, like did, did you fall into your current gig slash role um, with social media? And at one point did it go from an ac a happy accident to like, oh, this could be a, this could be a real thing. Sure, I'll start. So um, from day one of getting a dog, I knew I wanted to create an Instagram account. Uh, I actually discovered that I wanted to have a French Bulldog because I started following a few on Instagram. Um, the feed was chronological at the time. We'll talk a little bit about how different it is now and, and why that matters. It was, I think, a lot easier to um, gain organic followers uh, at that point in time. It was seven years ago. Um, but it really was a happy accident the whole time. Super organic growth. The account just kept growing and growing. I learned more as it went, um, you know, kind of changed my strategy and my thought process as it went about monetizing and brand partnerships, but, um, you know, started it for fun and loved it and continued it for fun. So really just, you know, has become a um, hobby that takes a lot of my time. And what are the, so what goals do you have now? Both like, what's a realistic, if you didn't have any time goal and then what would be like a dream scenario? Oh my God, if this happened. So I used to benchmark my goals by the number of followers, um, kind of stopped doing that now. But for me, the goal has been um, fame and popularity for the sake of the fun of fame and popularity. I, in that sense, call Lola a accidental inf influencer or an organic influencer in the sense that I don't seek out brand partnerships. I very rarely do brand partnerships. That doesn't mean that Lola doesn't have a ton of power in terms of the intersection of her content, what her fans care about, and the brands that are organic in our everyday lives. Um, but it is organic in the sense that it's really just a popular account um, that a lot of people follow. And my intent is not to spread anything but kind of the happiness of, of cute dog photos. Um, so we still do have, though, as I said, tons of power. Like her fans want to know what food she eats and what bed she's laying in and where my couch and my rug came from and what the brand is of her scarf. So there's tons and tons of of opportunities there. They're just, you know, they're still pretty organic. And my goals are always just to just to continue to grow it, uh, honestly, because it's fun. And, you know, I'll probably talk about this a little bit more later, but the money has never been enough to make really even a dent. Um, and so for me, kind of compromising the integrity of our content in order to generate a very small amount of income just hasn't really been worth it. Um, so the goal has really been throughout the life of this account, just get more followers, have more engagement, build more community, as long as it stays fun. Yeah, see where it goes. Cool. Hannah, how about you? How did you, when did you go from Hannah to a plant-based hoe? 
Um, it was purely to have a, a separate account for my sustainability habits. I was doing this thing on my personal channel for uh, Earth Month in 2019, I guess, and just got a lot of great feedback from it. So I was like, okay, we'll keep this going. I'll, I'll make a separate account. Me and like a couple of like other interns were like, you gotta name it plant-based toast. So I was like, okay, I guess that's who she is now. And um, then quarantine hit and it just kind of became this like necessary outlet to have something and to have like communication and constant um, connection with other people while being stuck at home. So um, yeah, once I really started kind of letting myself sink into it a little bit deeper, it just started to grow and, and the more it grew, the more you find out there are a bunch of random people who just want to know how your day went and want to know where do you thrift your clothes? What do you do this? Tell me about like, what are you doing to keep your like mental sanity in quarantine? And so now it's less, it's still like the core is still about sustainability, but it's really become more of like a community to make sure that everyone is doing okay and helping others at the same time. Mm. Yeah, so right now, uh, yeah, sometimes you're, I'll see your stuff in my feed and it'll make me pause and be like, oh, how am I doing? Let's take stock, let's like take a breather. Um, so you are technically, I mean, if depending on the category, micro, nano, right? Like a couple thousand followers. Mm -hmm. um, what would be, not that it has to be that like superficial metric, but what would be your, again, your dream goal? Oh my goodness, it'd be amazing if this happened slash what's the kind of current trajectory? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I think when I first started gaining traction, it's hard not to fall into how do I get more likes? How do I get more followers? And Instagram is exactly how it was in the beginning. Like I know I could post, I know the type of content I could post and it would explode. And like, there's no way around the fact that the right angle and the right types of pictures are gonna get a little bit more engagement than others. Um, but lately my growth has slowed down a little bit, but I spend a lot more time talking to people in my DMs of just like, just having conversations and making genuine connections. And I think that's, that's what I would really love is just to be able to continue that um, through Instagram and through any other, you know, opportunities that come up to talk to people about what they're doing and what they're wanting to do and how to get there. Mm. You, you and Rachel seem to be kind of on the same page in terms of like, I'm doing it and it's growing, but I want to keep it in hindsight, we should have got someone who's just like sold out hardcore. Like, look, I am just in this for the money. I don't care about anything yeah. or anyone. Um, oh, and by the way, if you guys can type your um, handles into the chat so people can follow you and find you and they can look you up as you're talking. Uh, so Casey, you are on the other side of this, right? You have been in charge of looking for different influencers to partner with brands. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, so I stumbled into this as well. Um, I actually have my Bachelor of Fine Arts. I went to school for design, um, but kind of my senior year realized I liked all the thought and strategy that went into advertising instead of making the actual ad. So I kind of just started in media planning in general, doing just digital stuff. So that's, you know, looking at ads on websites, looking at ads on social media sometimes, but mostly focused on the regular digital stuff and discovered that Social media, as you can all probably see, is constantly growing and it's constantly changing and there's nothing stacking about it. And that kind of drew me towards the more social based roles. And my most recent job was very much like a stumbled upon um, lucky, lucky kind of opportunity that came along at the right time. So what I do is alongside other things now at my current role, but previously I was doing everything post content being posted. So after say Lola or Plant Based Ho um, has a partnership, that company who they're partnering with may negotiate the rights to their images to advertise on their own. So that is everything I do. I help build the audiences to figure out who's best going to be served by that content, run actually the campaigns within Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest, or we're about to do one with TikTok for one of the campaigns that are the clients I'm working on now. Um, and then evaluating to see if we were able to successfully build on the content the influencer gave originally and build 
something more for that and what kind of reach, um, engagement, et cetera, we can get with money behind it. Hmm. So what's the, just so we have a frame of reference, what's the lowest level like follower wise and the highest level follower wise influencer you've worked with and what, what were their like rates or what was the, um, so know. I can't speak to rates, although the like general price that I've heard is about a dollar per per hundred followers. Um, whether that's actually true or not, I wasn't part of the negotiations of the influencers themselves, but it really, really depended on the brand. Um, one of the biggest clients we used to work with was European Wax Center and they were using people who had 5,000 followers all the way up to someone like Kayla from The Bachelor who's got over a million. Um, so it really much depends first on budget, how much budget do you have for the influencer? And then also kind of who do you wanna reach? Some people like Kayla may have these huge followings, but if their engagement isn't particularly great, it may be better to focus on someone with a smaller audience where she's receiving, you know, 80% of her followers are interacting with content over the course of a week or, you know, about 5% of her audience is liking or commenting on every single one of her posts. That can be more valuable to what you want to accomplish than just getting it out there because of the amount of people who may know their name or their handle. Yeah, is it, the, the general rule seems to be that, the, you know, the higher, once you get into the millions, the engagement gets really low, like a whatever, Kim Kardashian has like 220 million, but the engagement rate's probably like 0. 0.00 whatever. Um, yeah. Do the influencers come, do they, pitch you or or do they have an agent that you you're like yeah we want that one and that one depends on the person you know micro or nano um some of the lower level ones it just may not be worth the money to hire an agent because obviously you know they would get a cut of whatever um and there's just a lot more steps to go through um but it it very much depends on the person um regardless kind of like rachel was saying about how the Instagram feed and everything is really changing. Um, instead of using followers as kind of a um, gauge of whether or not you want to work with someone, engagement is really becoming that end all be all um, where you can, you know, make sure that if someone does have 220 million followers, you know, their level of engagement you're anticipating is going to be less than someone who is on the smaller side, but that then factors into who you want to actually pull together for a campaign. Hmm. And what, how many of the influencers that you all worked with were like Rachel and Hannah, where they're doing it as a side gig, kind of for fun, creative outlet. And like, at what point does it, or can it become a, you know, before you become like a Logan Paul, Jake Paul, like full-time, <laughs> whatever job. Um, I think it depends on the person. Again, someone like Rachel can have 182,000 followers for Lola, but at the end of the day, you know, because she is willing to, you know, she has a full-time job, this is her fun. She's not going all in, but there are, you know, people who do have 182K followers and that's their lives. That is now entirely how they make their income. It's heavily dependent on who that person is and, you know, what, what their goal of their account was. Is it still, was it fun to start and still fun or was it fun to start and now it's a business? Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, so Rachel, we're, we're going to circle back to you. And okay. this is like a general, if someone's tuning in and they're half whatever listening, th this is it. This is like the, the super condensed, whatever, too long, didn't read. What's one thing you know about influencing now that you didn't when you started? Uh, something that surprised you. And somebody who's considering following in your footsteps, what's one thing they should know? Um, okay, so I didn't prep for this question directly. So I'm gonna, you're going to watch the wheels turn in my head. So the one thing I didn't know about influencing when I started, and Casey might disagree, but I think a lot of the brands that interact with Lola are not the kind of brands that are working with Casey, is that brands are very reluctant to give you something in return. I think that about 95% of the solicitations I get from brands are free content only or free product only. And this is not designer sunglasses. This is a dog collar or a dog leash or a dog bed, which might be great, but I have to, and again, it's maybe partly because this is my hobby job, but I have to often purchase the content, submit a receipt to get an expense. They want three stories and a video and this aspect ratio and this color and no red and no stripes. And 
what do I get in return? Literally just that free product. They don't want to post, you know, maybe it's a chance to get posted on the brand's page. And oh, by the way, I have more followers than the brand. So there's just a ton of kind of crappy solicitation out there that you have to wade through to find the gems because there are some really good gems. There are some brands that are doing such a good job really identifying the right partners that actually want to consider the influencer as a partner and not just, um, you know, a place to sort of show their product. But it's, it's a lot of work to sort of wade through some of, you know, the, the crap that's out there uh, in terms of people that are solicit soliciting influencer work. What's the most random or just out of left field brand? Like what this for sure. my dog? So I have this prepared actually. I'm gonna oh. flip through a bunch of other slides. Hang on, maybe we'll call, talk about these later. I called yeah, this the poop. Background. <laughs> this is uh, a solicitation from January 14th for an art travel shoe brand in Spain. This is the kind of stuff that comes into my inbox uh. all the time. Um, we get some more fun stuff that just has nothing to do with the dog, like a lot of watches or, or bottles of wine. But I mean, it is, it just, so that's, that was the out of left field choice that I uh, thought I would share with you guys today. All those things are great on their own. It, yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's just throw a lot of adjectives together and uh, spam out influencers. That's pretty ambitious to say I'm starting an art travel shoe brand. Yep. Um, do you want to show your, uh, the, your, your pitch? the Lola stuff now? Sure. So um, the question that, that one of the, the um, questions that Professor Pittman asked me to, to think about was how do you stand out? So I presume a lot of you in the audience who have a pet have a social media account for that pet, or you certainly know somebody who got a puppy and put it on Instagram, or put it on Facebook or put it on TikTok. And so how do I think about standing out in that sea of animal accounts? Um, and first of all, this is just, this is uh, Lola's Instagram on the left and TikTok on the right. Um, the key to standing out is consistency for me. So I think a lot of people think that variety is important. I think that that is entirely wrong. If you have someone, someone who follows Lola, this is not the only dog they're following. This is not the only French bulldog they're following. So they're flicking through their feed. Do they really recognize the difference between Lola and Lola's friend, Walter, who looks kind of exactly the same to a stranger? Not really. So consistency in visuals to me is really, really important. This is a good example, as well as just a, an opportunity for me to show you her, her cute little kissy face. Um, I post photos like this all the time. I might have a photo shoot that resulted in six super cute photos that all look the same. I'll post them all in a row. Your followers are not gonna remember or care that, oh, she posted a similar photo yesterday. If it's cute, it's cute. You can post the same photo over and over. I mean, I wouldn't totally recommend that, but I've accidentally double or triple posted a photo, you know, a couple times within a month. and. They get the same amount of engagement each time. Like, I don't, I think you shouldn't overestimate, you know, the like attention span of your followers. Um, you know, the photo is cute, it's cute and it'll do well. But it also just helps people to breed recognition and familiarity. I even, I posted a photo like this a couple of days ago. And one of the comments I got was, I always recognize Lola and her puffy cheeks. So like, that's an exact perfect exemplification of, of the reason that I think consistency is so important. Um, couple other examples. This is Lola stretching. We post about it all the time. Every dog stretches. I think this is like, it's super cute, but it's not really unique to my dog, but I capture it and I post it all the time. And it just breeds this little community where people know what to expect when they come to this page. Um, another example, Lola's bed. Um, super cute again, but like she has three of this bed in various places throughout my house. If I post a photo of her in a different bed, people say, where's the teal bed? Where's the blue bed? Like, it's just about building a brand and a personality that people recognize and feel familiar with. Um, and so that comes through in the visuals, but it's also in the voice. So I always post in the first person. I never break the fourth wall. I make sure to keep a consistent personality. And that's not something that's easy to do, but you know, if you're consistent about, consistent about it, I think it really works. And I think there's a lot of dissonance for her followers. If all of a sudden I, I said Lola instead of I, they'd be like, who's talking? Is this the human? Is something wrong with Lola? Did something happen? Mm. Um, and then it's consistency in the themes. So, you know, I will, I will, um, I will concentrate her content around five or six themes so that people get to know her. So her fans know that she loves carrots. She loves produce in general. Uh, she has a cabana that she sits in in the summer. She always sings when she wants to tell me that her house plants need to be watered. Like silly little things, but they are so important for community. And when you're looking for engagement, that's not just a like, but a comment or a share. 
to have like these little things that people know about that you are working on or, you know, that she's always going to be involved in are I think really, really important. Um, the other thing that I always talk about with people is the actual quality of the photos. So I do have a real camera. I am not a photographer. It's a basic mirrorless camera, but I think it's really important, especially for a baby or a dog that's just moving around quickly. Obviously, you know, for, for other types of content, it's less important. But something people always say to me is Lola is so expressive. I don't think Lola is more expressive than any other dog. I just post the photos that everyone else throws away. You know, I think people want like, like this photo right here, I think is amazing. I love it. I think it's super cute. And people are like, oh, she's so expressive. I just think most people throw that photo away and they wait for a photo where her lips aren't pursed and she's just smiling or, you know, looking straight at the camera. So I think that, you know, thinking about unexpected angles, but always making sure you're close up and, uh, you know, using a decent enough camera that you actually have something crisp and clear is also really important for standing out. Um, the other thing I just want to talk about quickly is a little bit more tactical. I've called it handles and hashtags. One thing that I tell people that are just starting out that I think is really helpful is when you're thinking about your handle, make sure that it's something that you can verbally communicate to someone that they'll remember. So many times I've said to someone, you know, what's your handle? And they're like, oh, it's R47 underscore underscore zero o zero. It's like, nobody's ever gonna remember that. Lola Barksdale is even not that great. I, you know, kind of learned this lesson later on, but I have very often people who literally stop me on the street. Can I take a photo of your dog? And, you know, if if I have time, I let them take a photo, but I also tell them she's on Instagram. It's Lola Barksdale. No spaces, no underscores, no nothing. And I think that that is, um, you know, really important, uh, you know, as short and concise as possible. And then last thing is just about hashtags. A lot of people will hashtag a dog post with hashtag puppy, or hashtag dog. I think you have to think about hashtags as what are people actually searching for? If you're using a hashtag to actually bring people who don't follow you to your content, I don't think that anyone is searching Instagram for hashtag dog. They are going to get inundated with millions of posts that have been posted in the last five seconds. And it's not gonna be what they're looking for. They might be looking for a cream French bulldog. They might be looking for, you know, um, dog singing or whatever it is. But think about specific things that people are actually going to search for rather than just super generic hashtags that might be descriptive of your photo but are not going to actually bring any new audience members to your content. Um, that is kind of my basics for how I think about standing out. That's really good. And as you were talking, I was wondering, I was wondering what is the Frenchie community? And my first thought was, does Lola Bark still have like a nemesis or a rival who's like- She has a boyfriend, she has little friends. She's got the whole crew. She has the Boston crew um, that also, you know, they have, they've got a huge, huge community. I think your next step needs to be pitching Netflix on a 10 episode series because I would watch this <laughs> <laughs> riveting reality TV. Uh, okay, Hannah, can you talk about um, something you know now that you didn't know when you started your plant-based hoe journey? Um, and anybody who, who is thinking about sustainable green well-being type, um, if not influencing, whatever you would call it. Um, yeah, your tips, something they should know. Um. You know, I, mean, I would say that the biggest thing is that don't ever under, underestimate yourself um, in how interesting people will find you. Because it feels like I'm just like, you know, I'm here in Knoxville, quarantined, like, you know, like everyone else is doing, and somehow have like gained 2,000 followers, which I will also say, I know that that never sounds like a lot, but if you go just... If you ever need to like bring yourself back to reality, just go on Google and type in what do 2000 people all together look like? And you'll realize like, oh my gosh, that's like a theater of people who are following me. Um, and so, you know, I just never underestimate yourself and how interesting people find you and what people want to know about you. And brands do the same. Um, I have some like big leaders in, the sustainability world that for whatever reason have found me and follow me and interact with me and being so small um still already like starting communication with uh if anybody's in sustainability package free is a huge huge leader in the sustainability world and it's like one of the companies that has led me to be um minimal waste and to like have them follow me is like crazy um, 
but yeah, I'd say just never underestimate yourself. Brands will come to you and, and set your standards high when you first start um, because, you know, like, especially in sustainability, you know, if a company comes to me and they say, hey, we'd love to send you some stuff, I'll say, great, cool. I'll review it and I'll be honest. If I don't like it, I won't post anything. We don't have to, like, I don't have to be negative about it, but if I don't like it, you're not getting a post just because you sent it to me. Um, and also like, no, I also don't want to promote overconsumption. So if you're making things from scratch, I'm going to tell people don't buy it unless you need it. So like set yourself up. Um, and then, you know, as you, as you get bigger, then you can start to set your standards even higher. And I don't do posts just because you sent me something. Um, Thanks. And we asked Rachel this, so it's, we have to ask you too, what's the most random or out there? Have you gotten any strange collab product requests, DMs? I, you know, I wouldn't say that I have gotten anything too weird as much as just like a lot of companies that want that environmental stamp and they're not environmental at all. Like they're absolutely terrible companies. And so it's kind of just like this opportunity to play with them. And I'm like, cool, can you tell me about where your stuff is produced? And they're like, oh, it's over here. I'm like, okay, how are the worker conditions? How are this or that? And they're like, oh, just kidding. We are a sweatshop. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I knew that. I knew that, but I just needed to make sure that we were on the same page. Um, and no, I will not be posting you on my account. Thank you. And the people, those people that are contacting you, I wonder if they're Casey type people, like if they're at an, are, are they with a brand or that or like, or with the agency? Like, do they even know? Are they just like, look, man, this, I'm supposed to find you. I don't know what, I haven't been to whatever, you know, Bangladesh, wherever this factory is. I don't know what's going on. I don't think that, I think they're just like little tiny companies somewhere that just get a lot of stock photos and pretend that they're selling like, high-end stuff because i would imagine if someone is actually like ad has a has a real like ad agency that's scouting for them and they would find someone that is literally based on like sustainability they're not kind of promoting unethical labor yeah items so unless they're somehow involved with art and travel and shoes in which case then then no rules yeah, new new creative horizon. Nothing nothing multiplies. Um, all right, Casey, something you know now that you didn't when you started, and anybody who wants to get into um, kind of the account management, like agency type side, something they should know about. I think the most interesting thing to me is how an entire industry has basically sprung up about evaluating influencers and determining whether something is successful, whether someone's worth partnering with. There is a number of different platforms where you can just plug in someone's um, handle. It'll tell you how many followers they have. It'll break down their audience for you. You know, if you're looking for someone who you want to reach both men and men and women, but their audience skews like 80% women, you know, maybe they're not the best part. There is, they'll, sort their follower and to see like what attributes they're most likely to be so whether they're going to be shut they're going to be you know like shopaholics or they're sports fans it's just truly crazy the kind of data that comes into play and you know the partnerships that aren't successful are the ones where like hannah was saying you know you're reaching out for something that isn't beneficial to either end of the partnership you want someone who the content is going to be relevant to their followers but then they also make sense as part of your campaign it's a total waste of money to put all this time and effort like rachel was saying it's not just posting a photo anymore it's for some people it's hiring a photographer for some people it's actually going to a studio and shooting um maybe it's one outfit maybe it's five different products um it really really depends on the partnership and what the goal of the campaign is and how much the company wants to put into this campaign and there's really not much guesswork in it anymore there's a lot of ways to really dig in and find who is the right person. And of course there is some, you know, human aspect. There are people who actually do this evaluation and are going and sorting through it to find who they actually think is the right fit. But it's an entire industry now. It's not just the influencers, it's everything backing up the influencers that kind of just blew my mind. And have you, so we've talked about the influencers and their, um, 
their size and I'm sure like niche areas of expertise, whether it's, you know, green, um, whatever. Have you had an instance and it probably isn't your job. You're probably, this is like probably at the higher levels, but where a brand who's big, who wants to, you know, like a Walmart or somebody with a not great history, who's like, I know we'll get a couple in, you know, influence in this area and we'll instantly be cool. And you have to, and I have a great example. That's a terrible example. Um, I worked on a number of Wells Fargo campaigns um, with influencers um, over the last year. Um, a lot of it was around the Women's World Cup, um, which they were a big sponsor of. Um, the agency I used to work at also um, was part of a larger sports agency. So they represented a number of soccer players who, you know, came in and talked about how, you know, how post soccer, what they've had to do to like pull their lives together and like things that are important to them and integrity and stuff. And, you know, it wasn't my job to necessarily monitor the comments, but at the end of the day, we're sending all of these things and flagging to the clients, like, just beware, people are talking about, <laughs> you know, not, they're not talking about the content. Like, yes, they think Abby Wambach is awesome, but for every comment about that, there's five more about, oh, Wells Fargo opened an account in my name, or like, what have you been involved in with like the Dakota pipeline and stuff like that. So it's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm an agency person, you know, I work on what I'm contracted for, you know, not saying ethics are out the door, but <laughs> there's definitely less flexibility than if I was a Rachel or a Hannah and I can pick and choose my partnerships. It's more of just setting kind of the right tone and making sure the client understands also what they're getting into. And, you know, it's not necessarily always going to work out where everything's positive. And, you know, we do pause stuff. We do pause our promotions. If things are going on, I'll never forget. I was, I advise at um, my sorority chapter at Columbia and I was up there for a meeting and we were running a basketball based campaign and, Co and it came out that Kobe Bryant had passed away. So I had to run to a Starbucks to get internet so that I could turn off all of our campaigns because it just felt so insensitive to be doing that right then. So there's, a lot of factors that go into everything. And I can't tell you a single influencer campaign where it's always been positive and it's always been everything smooth sailing. You know, it's a lot of thinking on your feet and making sure to kind of think ahead of anything that may potentially happen. And in worst cases, just letting the client know, like, we don't recommend running right now. We don't recommend posting right now. You know, it's, it's our part, it's part of the partnership. They partner with us and we partner with them to make sure that everyone's on the same page and things are as successful as possible. Hmm. Um, I put this in the chat. I forgot to say it. If anybody has any questions, you can type it in the in the chat and make sure you're typing it to panelists um, or and or attendees. And I, I will ask the panelists um, in a few minutes uh, that that Wells Fargo example well, the Kobe Bryant's like a sad example. The Wells Fargo is still sad what happened. Um, but those examples make up like crisis day and social and, and social media classes always I'm like, all right, everyone, Google the worst social media fails of the last year. And it's always stuff like that. Um, tone deaf this year. Yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. Like there's always a brand that shouldn't be post like ice, I think posted something this year. Everyone's like, are you kidding me? Um, there's always crazy examples. Uh, man. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, man. Having to the, the, the Kobe Bryant thing is a good example of. I mean, you having the awareness to be like, this probably, sh you know, basketball is great. If we pause this for a week, a month, um, it'll run again, just not right now. There's another funny example, Casey. I don't know if you were at your current agency when this happened. It's not Lola related, but um, there was some work being done for Weight Watchers launching under the hashtag WW. And it was when there was talk of World War Three, and that the WW hashtag started going viral for World War Three, And it was like, no, 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 we got to pull this. We got to pull this. Like, you know, stuff like that just happens all the time. And I just echo the comment that you've got to be nimble and you've got to be transparent with the brands about, you know, pulling something, even if you've spent months and months planning it, because, you know, you can't control what's going to happen in the world. And, you know, stuff goes viral all the time that you would just never expect. Yeah. And when you also, when you're an influencer and you partner with a company, you grant them the rights to promote your photo or whatever for a certain number of days. So you may lose out on that. And it's really just kind of weighing the pros and cons of it. You know, is it worth getting, you know, a couple 
hundred thousand more people's eyes on it, but they may have an incredibly negative reaction versus getting it under less eyes. But, you know, people have a positive experience seeing whatever it is you're promoting. And that's happened, you know, when we had a partnership on Mrs. Meyers um, Clean Day, which is a brand I work on now that originally the partnership was supposed to launch um, the rights for all of the usage started in like mid January and there was a lot of stuff going on social media in mid January that it just didn't seem right to run around. So we ended up waiting until the end of January. And yes, we lost like a week and a half, two weeks of the rights, but that meant that we weren't potentially aligning the brand and the promote and the influencers, because you have to think that this is their brands as well, not just ours around something that may be damaging. Is there a, I imagine the answer is no, but I'm still going to ask. I'm wondering if there's like a threshold of like sentiment, like, okay, once it's like 50, 50, you know, half good comments, half bad, keep going. But is there like a threshold, like, all right, once it gets to be this much negative, we got to pull the plug or is it, I imagine it's always subjective and just a human. Yeah, it's decision. definitely subjective and it depends on like what the mitigating factor is. Like if it is world war three, as Rachel was saying, like, even if it's not everybody, if enough people are saying it, you'd want to pull away. If, for example, because now I work on all product lines, you know, if the product's out of stock, is are enough people complaining more about the product being out of stock than actually being receptive to the ads? That's another case where you kind of have to gut check and whether or not that's what you want people to see in their feeds. Hmm. Um, all right. So there's one question in chat, and Hannah, you can start it because it's it's kind of about being a newer influencer. Um, Someone said, for starting out on social media, what do you think is the best way to gain followers or new people seeing your content? Is it the hashtag realm, stories, promotion, giveaways, or some combination of all those? One thing I will say is uh, Instagram, the Instagram algorithm is always changing. Um, well, it's not always changing, but it's never going to benefit you. And so it's really hard to try to keep up with how am I supposed to make sure that my stuff on my current followers is getting shown on their screen and then hopefully showing up on the explore page or something like that. Um, so for me, I have never promoted any pictures. Um, I prefer organic growth, uh, but I know people who do and it's, I think that's more of just like a personal preference. Um, but the biggest thing that helped me was finding your niche and then interacting with people who are in that. So getting to know other people who are focused on bettering themselves and the planet, because one, that's going to help you find a little bit more meaning in just like doing influencer content because it can feel very artificial. So it's going to allow you to, to feel like you're actually, you know, doing something and bettering, you know, whatever it is that you want to focus on. Um, but it's also going to allow you to grow because now those people are going to talk about you and people are going to be more interested in what people they already trust recommend than seeing your paid promotion. Rachel, any thoughts on when you started out? Sure. Like was there one, one post where, where Lola? Um, we had a couple posts that gave us um, kind of a step change in Lola's follower account. Most of those are what I'd call from like a feature account. You know, there will be, especially in the animal world, there'll be an account with like a million followers or there are like meme accounts now. This was kind of before meme accounts existed. Um, you know, that would, that would, it probably happened two or three times um, that somebody would post her and she would get 10,000 followers in a day or 15,000 followers in a day. Uh, those are few and far between, but obviously they make a really big difference. And then you kind of get a, a you know, a, a tailwind of increased followers over the course of the next several weeks. Um, to echo what Hannah said, though, building community is so, so important. And I think it's real community. Like people always say to me when they're starting out, oh, do you comment on a lot of people's posts or do you follow a lot of people? And the tone of that question, I think, is wrong because yeah, I do follow people, not a lot of people, but I follow people whose content I care about. I do post on on my friends, uh, you know, I comment on my friends' posts, but also the ones I care about. I'm not commenting on people's posts just for the sake of it, to get my name out there. I'm commenting because I'm actually trying to build community, breed that familiarity, build a brand by actually interacting with people in a genuine way. And 
I think that people can very easily see through, see through that. Like I'll have people who come on every single one of Lola's posts and I a hundred percent know they are just trying to get me to follow them back. Um, I don't do it because they are making zero genuine connection, never an actual question. Always just like, hi, or ha ha. Like, it's just like, I mean, maybe I'm not giving them enough credit, but you know, it's, it's pretty clear sometimes when people think that they can sort of be lazy about building community. And I don't know, I just, I kind of don't buy it. I think that, I think that, you know, if you are, if you are in it to really push a message that you care about, like Hannah is, and you know, you, you want something that feels pretty genuine, you've got to, you've got to do it in a genuine way. And so I think the community aspect is really, really important, but you kind of have to mean it. I think even those of us regular uh, civilian non-influencers have had that where you're like, why did this Hungarian folk piano duo artist follow me? Oh, they want me to follow them. No, no, thank you. I'm, right. I'm, I'm all good. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, what are your opinions on influencers doing loop giveaways? Is it really just buying followers or is it a genuine way to grow? What's a loop giveaway? Is it like a giveaway? I think it's where it's like, okay, follow these 10 accounts and then somebody will, I don't know, maybe that's not quite what it'll Yeah, follow these two accounts, like, post okay. this, okay. I mean, I don't do it, Casey. I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you've done that and had success. Um, again, I don't know. I think it depends on what's being given away. If it's like a super cool product that's valuable that you actually want a chance at winning, yeah, you'll go to those 10 accounts and you'll follow them. So in that sense, as a consumer, Sure, maybe it's worth it to you. Uh, as an influencer, is it going to get you some new followers? Maybe. But I think that, I mean, for better or worse, one of the things that the algorithm does now, at least on Instagram, is if I get 400 new followers from a giveaway, but they actually don't care about my content, and the next three times I post after they follow me, they don't interact with it, they're going to stop seeing my content. So it almost like takes care of itself, and those followers just become empty numbers. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to the fact that I've run one giveaway, like paid campaign in my career. And it was an influencer one. Um, there was a female focused sports account that wanted that was connected to a larger company and they wanted to grow the audience. So what we did was we contracted influencers um, who created prints like inspirational prints of that were related to sports with like quotes and graphics and the giveaway was to win prints the actual like physical prints of these but what's interesting from a paid perspective is you can't run a campaign to get people to follow an account that's actually one of the few things you can't do so there's a lot of problem solving for then how to actually get people to your page to do the giveaway and sometimes it's not quite <laughs> it's not quite what you want to happen but you know instead of being able to drive someone to an account you have to add their account as a link in a facebook story or in an instagram story like that's the only way to get people to your page and i think the clients were actually really excited you know with the results the prints were amazing the content was wonderful the response was great but it's definitely a balance between, you know, what the client thinks they can get out of the giveaway, what the brand thinks they can get out of the giveaway, and then what is actually feasible to do. And that goes for, I hope, partnerships as well. If you're giving something away, you need to evaluate what it's going to do for you and the account. Hmm. Um, another question, Dr. Childers, can we talk about setting objectives for influencer campaigns? Um, I assume it's dependent on a brand. Um, students can directly benefit from learning more about objective setting to about, yeah. So how much of it is setting uh, campaign objectives up, up front versus maybe discovering along the way uh, as stuff takes off that you didn't expect or, or is not going as well? So I don't know if anybody wants to talk about goals or objectives, whether it's official or personal or what. Um, I can speak from, you know, like the media perspective. So it's settled up front with the client whenever you contract a campaign. Um, so for example, you can set up a campaign where you want to drive purchases of your product, or maybe you want people to watch a video, or maybe you want people to click a link out to the website, or maybe you just want to hit as many potential people as possible. That's set up front and that's kind of then how you shape the campaign and then also the promotions behind it. If you want someone 
to get it to as many people as possible. Maybe someone like Lola is going to be better because she has a really wide audience. But if you're looking for people to, you know, enter, enter a giveaway or go out to a site, then maybe someone like Hannah, whose followers are less, but are really, really into her content and are willing to click out to a website that may be a better person to contact. Um, and then at the end of the day, you're evaluating it based on all the data you get in. There is so much data behind this. It's, you know, I was, I was an art kid, but I spend all of my days in Excel and it's honestly just as cool because you're literally taking a peek into these people's lives and how they react to your content and whether they did do what you thought they were going to do and kind of evaluate it from there. Do the, do, the see, do you have clients who have goals that you're like, that's a dumb goal? Like if they still want likes or they still want, you know, kind of things that we're saying are like, oh, that's a five-year-old goal. You need better. Yes, goals. there is definitely um, clients who I've worked with in the past who have said like, I want 20 million people to see my content, but their budget is like $25,000. Like that's, it's education. It's, you know, setting realistic expectations. And I'm sure it's the same for you when someone reaches out to you and is like, okay, you're going to make this post, you know, like you're going to, I bet all at like 150,000 of Lola's followers are going to see it. And it's, no, that's not realistic. And you're setting everyone up for failure if you're not educating both sides on what how, what goes into it and what you get out of it. Are the are the contracts typically set? Like we'll give you say a thousand dollars for two hundred fifty conversions where they go to the website, or is it is it ever um, like incentivized? Like for every ten thousand views you get above this, you get you know. A lot of it's just set at the beginning where it's a price uh -huh. per post or yeah. um, a lot of the times when we did campaigns, we just bake in, you know, where this amount is going to contracting the influencers getting posts for you. This amount is going towards the paid promotion that we'll do after we get the content. Um, and then obviously if the client doesn't want to do paid promotion, great, that's more money that goes back into actually getting the influencers and getting you more content. and negotiating also extra value. Sometimes if someone really loves the content, maybe you can get three stories instead of two, um, mm. stuff like that. It's all so dependent just because, I mean, Hannah's contract and Rachel's contract would look so different. And so, and it might depend on the brand who reaches out to them too. Cool. All right, another question. Have you had any trouble with people taking your content and posting it without credit? Ooh, I've had that problem with people posting my TikToks on Instagram. This is from Neil Springer. So we'll look you up on uh, TikTok, Neil. Um, on their Instagram reels and not crediting me. Ooh, kind of a creative license. Um, I have had that problem. Um, mostly I blame myself because I don't watermark my posts and my videos and I really should I know better um if you do please do it with Lola's th that little clenched butt cheek stretch just that that's my favorite part <laughs> <laughs> the um I think that that obviously doesn't prevent people from taking your content it happens all the time people think that anything you put on the internet is you know there for public consumption which is obviously not true but you're gonna have a hell of a time getting the platforms to help you police any of their terms of use. Um, I've had a couple times where somebody, you know, was very consistently taking my content and and masquerading it as their own. Especially, it's upsetting when somebody tries to sell puppies and says like, "Oh," and shows a picture of Lola, like this is the mom, like this is you know clearly not just yeah. People do that a lot. And so I've tried to, you know, report them on Instagram, but honestly, the process is so painful for trying to report somebody who's impersonating you that I think I've only followed through with the whole process once. Um, so watermark your content. Um, you know, if there's, there's not much more you can do other than that, it's gonna happen. My biggest sad story is that one of Lola's photos got shared on uh, an NBA halftime show um, on TNT and the hosts of so Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith were all talking about it because somebody tweeted at them about her photo, but some it was some random person who tweeted it and he just you know posted it as his own. And so we totally missed out on any potential recognition from there. So that's a total bummer. But again, I didn't watermark it. I should have known better. So it happens, but you know, you can definitely protect yourself a little bit. I will say I haven't personally had my stuff stolen as of yet however i um know people who have especially uh i keep up with a lot of 
artists and uh, specifically there's um, a friend of mine whose stuff is consistently getting stolen and sold on AliExpress and she's a sustainable uh, clothing designer and she like makes everything by hand and she's she's going all the way taking everyone to court and is is doing it um in that case I don't I know I will go ahead and say that Instagram will not help you um anything that you put up for you're like hey can you review this this is not right this person's doing this person's doing that Instagram is absolutely no help um so yeah I guess moral of the story is you got to be proactive if you're really want, hoping to to get anything done about that. Cool. Um, somebody in Q&A asked about using alternative text. I think that's like alt text, like where you like accessibility issues. Does it, do any of you all like where you put in what the, the, a description of the products you're talking about? Um, I don't know if anybody has any opinions on that stuff. All right, question two. Cargo, I did actually have to sit through a um, accessibility seminar before I was allowed to work on any of their media, you know, say what you will about the company, but you know, we did have to provide captions on everything. We did have to have alternative text for all of our videos, but it's 100% on like a company led basis. And that was also in the contracts with the influencers that they had to include the same. Um, and we added them to our videos um, and sent them back to them so that they would be able to have the accessible content. So places are starting to think about it. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's really been a quick moving change across the industry. I put, oh, go ahead, Hannah. I was gonna say, yeah, I put, I put closed captioning on any of my content that has speaking on it, um, which I did learn from TikTok. I didn't even, I mean, as any, you know, marginalized community comes, you don't, think about it until they bring it up to you and you're like oh my gosh I didn't even think about what it meant for you to be like hard of hearing or deaf or something like that but I also I think closed captioning is great because a lot of us are on our phones in public that if I'm you know posting a story or if I'm posting a video to make sure that these people can actually understand my content if they don't have headphones on um, is also important and then it just it's even better that it is also including marginalized communities and the disabled community. Yeah, you're you're one of the few people that I've like, there's not a lot of accounts doing it yet. And so it does stand out. Um, and it's like not in the way of the face, right? It's kind of off to the side. So it's still um, in designing, I'm guessing for bigger organizations, companies like for UT designing an online class, they, they went through, they're like, you can't use that orange. I'm like, it's the UT orange. They're like, no, red, green, colorblind, can't see it. You got to change the blue value by whatever, like 20 or something. Um, okay, another question. This is a good question, especially for uh, for everyone. Is there such a thing as posting too much? Because it's not chronological now. So you could do five posts in a day and who knows when your audience will see it. So how do you all think about the right amount or... Um, pace of putting out content? I can start. Um, of course, there's no such thing as posting too much. It all depends on your goals. If your goals are to show your friends and family 14 pictures of your child a day, then great, go for it. Um, you know, I mean, it depends on, it depends on what you want. Um, for gaining and growing and sustaining a community of engaged followers, I do think there's something as posting too much. Um, I have dramatically lowered the pace of my posting over the last two or three years. I used to post quite consistently twice or three times a day uh, at, at pretty regular intervals. And now I post maybe three times a week. Um, I have found that just fewer posts gets me more likely to have better engagement. However, you have to experiment. I've also found that the day after a really popular post, I'll also get a lot of engagement. And so sometimes I will accelerate it, but then it's like, when does that stop? The third day, does it die off? And a lot of it is just kind of a guessing game. Like, you know, as, as Hannah said, the algorithm is maybe not changing every day, but it's certainly a mystery every day. Um, even for someone like me who spends a lot of time thinking about and evaluating, you know, what kind of content has what kind of engagement, depending on what time you post, depending on what the content looks like. It's just really hard to predict sometimes what's gonna take off and what isn't. Um, I do think on the margin though, 
fewer posts are better. But there's of course an efficient frontier between posting too little so that people don't remember who you are or don't you know look forward to your posts. Um, you know, I've had a couple times where I'll go four or five days and I'll get DMs saying, you know, is Lola okay? Did something happen? Like, I have a real life, guys. Like, relax. Uh, she's fine. Um, but it's, it's cute. called you animal know, people, control. They're on their way. Um, you know, but people, people, people look for the content. So you have to find what works for you. But yeah, I do think. I do think for sustaining an engaged community, there is probably something that's posted too much. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. And also, um, it's really interesting because it it the type of content you're putting out, like you're dealing with not just Instagram posts, but reels, TikToks, stories, and so all of those are going to have different things that are working, um, like TikTok. I mean, a lot of people who are big on TikTok, you will, I've, you know, sometimes they'll post five videos at once in the hopes that one will gain a little bit of traction. And that's just like how the TikTok al algorithm is. Instagram's a little bit different. Um, I have seen things saying that, you know, and I, I think this is like good for your followers too. It's consistency. So don't, you know, don't post every single day for two weeks and then go dark for a month. Um, and anytime, like, if it's, you know, my feed's going to go down for a little bit, stories are a really great place to just be like, hey, busy, you know, I got a full-time job, I got to go do that instead of just being a plant-based hoe, so. Um, I was going to ask this a couple minutes ago, and then Dr. Childers just typed it. Um, for Hannah and Rachel, how do you stay creatively inspired? You know what, because there's, yeah, our social media diet's so divert. There's a million things we, we could be doing. So how do you, and I'm sure the answer with, as with a lot of stuff is it depends, but is there some account that you find inspiring, life-giving or, yeah, where do you, where, where do you keep new ideas coming from? Sure. For me, I mean, the bar is really low, frankly. I've got a super cute dog and she's super cute every day. So the, it is not hard like I'm not, I'm not creating the content in that sense. You know, I'm creating the captions and, and I do spend a decent amount of time thinking about that and making sure that I'm staying consistent to, you know, what I said before, the voice, the themes, um, you know, making sure there's not like a lot of, I won't post live, but making sure that I'm not posting like a summer looking photo in, in the winter. Um, but honestly, it's, it's hard to get burnt out when, you know, you just have an iPhone that takes decent photos and you've got a cute dog at your feet all the time. And so I think that, you know, Hannah might have it harder than I do. Um, I've got, you know, some pretty ready-made content. Uh, and so it hasn't really been, it hasn't really been a challenge for me, to be honest. Um, you know, combating like creator's block is, it's almost, it's a bigger, it's a bigger question than just social media because it has a lot to do. Like I've always considered myself a creative person. Having this platform is a creative outlet when I don't have the ability to make art in other ways. And so um, there are plenty of times where I'm like, I have nothing, I have nothing to post. And most of the time, the reason that I feel that way is just because I have created a bunch of rules that don't exist. I'm like, oh, well, I can't post that because my last post was also about fashion. So how am I gonna post two fashion posts? And I'm like, well, if I have if I have the post, why don't I post it instead of just like creating these little rules? Like even right now I had started like a self-love series in for February um, and being like the month of love or whatever. And I then went through a period with my mental health and I just wasn't able to like preach self-love and also be going through like a mentally not great time and so I just stopped it and then said hey guys I'm gonna pick it back up when I can and then I'll have to you know when it comes out it'll come out and there are no rules saying that I can't post different content until I'm ready to post that content again yeah for your for your brand or anyone who's being authentic and real then sharing the fact that you are at a creative block or can't post is actually part of what's going on. And people, everyone else be like, oh good, she feels it too. Cause I feel that way sometimes. Um, okay, we're kind of, we're getting near the end. So one more quick question. We, we've glazed over this a little bit, but the new algorithm, 
uh, one thing you've learned to be more effective, to grow following, have better engagement. I, I know, Hannah, I learned something from Plant-Based Ho, and that is a way to support your favorite creators is not just a like and not just a comment, right? There's, you had a tier list. It's like, if you like it, that's fine. Commenting is even better. Sharing it is even better. And if you really like them, then you like bookmark, save it, highlight it. So I learned that from you. So do you guys want to share one thing you've learned with the new algorithm, how to grow? Uh, one thing I've done is really tried to expand out of the dog community. Um, so the way I've done that is kind of through hashtags and it's pointing out other things in the photo that don't necessarily surround Lola. So I'm in a rental apartment right now, but you can see I have some house plants here. I have a ton of plants in my apartment and often they're in the background. So I went to some really popular houseplant accounts. There's like Urban Jungle, some houseplant bloggers, whatever. And I took some of their hashtags, like expanding your community out of your core um, you know, follower base. And that's been really great for me. It felt disingenuous because I was like, I don't want some poor houseplant person coming to my post and be like, hey, why'd they hashtag this? But like, there's a perfectly good houseplant in the photo. Why not? Um, you know, I've got, I've got a gray couch and a white carpet. So I'll do like monochrome interior design or something. You know, again, it feels like a little bit wrong, but like it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not lying to those people who are searching for those hashtags. So for me, just like really getting a completely different crop of people to come interact with my content has been a good way to break some of the patterns that I think the algorithm, um, you know, persists. Uh, firstly, I wanna say, I don't think anybody would be upset when they're looking through hashtags and see a really cute dog. <laughs> I, I don't think that could ever be a bad thing. So keep, keep doing that. That would definitely make my day. Um, but you know, the getting, getting more eyes in, in the algorithm is difficult because sometimes you just never know what's like the most random posts will somehow get a ton of shares. And that's even like in plant-based toe and some of the like clients that I have, you'll just do one post. And for some reason that one has really attracted a lot of attention. Um, one thing that I've found recently is the more you can tie your content to something significant that's going on, um, then that tends to get a lot of shares and, and saves. If it's something like, even like for Valentine's day, if you just had said something about it, people kind of like that relevance. Cool. Hannah, make sure and share. You you do social media for like 50 accounts. So share them in the chat just so people can follow to see. I know Flying Panda is good stuff. Um, Casey, anything you've learned about the new algorithm from your perspective? This is a sore topic for me because my algorithm for advertising is about to change drastically. And it's about the only thing I've talked about at work for like two months. But <laughs> I want to trigger you. I'm sorry. Say, it is really well known that TikTok, what makes it so valuable as a platform is the algorithm. I don't know what they did. I don't know how they did it, but far and away, the most well-designed and great algorithm of any social media platform. It does really get you the content you want based on what you've seen, which is to say, if you accidentally watch two, you know, like cat videos and you don't like cats, you're about to see 20 of them before it realizes you're not into them. But that being said, it is so good at figuring out who you are, what you like, and making sure to give that to you. And that's why you're starting to see more advertisements on it and more partnerships because people are beginning to take advantage of that. You know, it wasn't as big of a thing pre-quarantine and now it's blown up. I wasn't on TikTok before quarantine and now I'm probably on it like an hour a day just sending my friends videos. So, you know, we're all, we're all learning together kind of what works and what doesn't. Um, it's constantly growing, constantly changing. And that's honestly why this industry is so great, whether you're an influencer or just in regular advertising. Speaking of that amazing segue, last question, real short, best and or worst thing about working with social media. For me, it's the people I've met in real life, like actually made legit real life friends that I just never would have met otherwise. Honestly, I think it's hard to work in an industry that people don't understand very much. So the instances where I have been able to like make use of the knowledge um, 
in my like personal life is great. My best friend from college um, got laid off from her fashion job um, last summer and started her own actually ethical, sustainable fashion line. Um, and being able to help her, you know, set up ads and like talk to her about like how to best use influencers and like whether or not she should partner with people like that's been the greatest thing for me. And like, I can tell you, my parents still have no idea what I do day in and day out, but they appreciate it. And, you know, sometimes that's like the low, the bar to clear and that's fine, but everything is growing. Everything is changing. There's really never two days that are the same. And that's, what's so great about the industry. Cool. Yeah, I would, I would say, and this is part of the reason why even with the capabilities, if I had enough followers to, you know, just quit everything and be an influencer, I don't think I would do it is because it does get really easy to only focus on the amount of followers you have, the amount of likes you're getting and the amount of comments you're getting. And that can really take a toll on, on how you view yourself as just kind of like a product to be shown. Um, and like, you're so much more than what you post on social media. Uh, so it's like, you gotta, you gotta figure out your way to step away from that. Sometimes it's forced on you because the algorithm doesn't like what you're posting and your content's going to go down. Or sometimes it's just like a self-awareness moment. You are more than the number of likes you get. That's a good lesson. And for Rachel, it's not just social media. It's the friends you meet along the way. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's say thank you to Hannah, Casey, and Rachel. We can give them snaps or claps wherever you are. Woo, woo, woo. Um, thank you guys so much. And now Dr. Childers is going to close us. So we also need to say thank you to Dr. Pittman for putting this awesome panel together and for moderating for us today. So thank you to Dr. Pittman, Hannah, Casey, and Rachel. Um, very, very interesting panel and um, an important topic that I think our students are very um, much influenced by um, and kind of, um, I know as, as a professor myself too, get, I get a ton of questions about how do I become an influencer? I, I love so-and-so, how do I do this? So I think that you all imported a lot of um, tangible um, advice today, to be honest, um, to a lot of our students that have had some questions. So thank you all very much for joining us. The last thing I want to say is that we are concluding day two of Social Media Week 2021. Um, we have one more day left. Tomorrow has three really great sessions. The first one starts at 9.50 a.m. and it features um, one of our public relations alums named Ed Patterson. He has brought in Soon May Kim, um, who is Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for Omnicom Public Relations. Um, and they're going to have a fireside chat, basically, about how social media has impacted all of the social justice movements that have been um, uh, trending and taking up a lot of our media space and headspace, um, especially in the last year or so. Then at 110, we have three people from the Country Music Association that are going to discuss um, how the Country Music Association, music and entertainment, um, some of those industries were the very first ones to close and they're going to be the last ones to open in our pandemic, right? So um, the title of that session at 110 is Pivoting in a Pandemic, First to Close, Last to Open. And um, in particular, we have two UT graduates that will serve on that panel. And one of those is Mary Overend, who graduated from our advertising program in 2009. And then finally, that takes us to tomorrow night for our keynote session at 6 p.m. with the one and only Adam Brown. I know a lot of you have heard of the Adam Brown Social Media Command Center. Um, this is the individual it's named after. And Adam works for Salesforce and is basically going to provide us a keynote that talks all about how important it is to recognize the importance of all the data that we're gathering on people. So whenever we target individuals and audiences, um, that we are using that data in an ethical manner, that we understand the conversations that can go um, and you know, cross with not being good stewards of data and how we also mesh those right brain and left brain challenges um, and connecting with people in the future with our persuasive content. So. Um, those are our three last sessions. Um, day two was a big, big success, especially with these four that we just heard from. So thank you so much for your time. And I hope to see as many of you as possible tomorrow at 9.50.
Bye.